Right, morning, morning. Again. Right, okay, so we're going to talk about the five critical mistakes of dysfunctional managers. And uh, we are asking everybody about are there any kinds of uh, dysfunctional managers that you have met in your lives? And what are some of their characteristics? So, uh, could, uh, could some of us uh, briefly share some of those, um, can I say, bad experiences that you had or some of the uh, things you actually see uh, with uh, dysfunctional managers? Who would like to volunteer? <laughs> Very dominant. Very dominant? And okay. always don't, want, don't know what he or she wants, okay. but always okay. change. <laughs> right, right, right. It's, it's okay to be dominant if you know what you're doing. Mm. Right, but uh, you're dominant and you don't really know what you're doing. Mm. Okay, that's, that's one part. Okay, what else? Nothing this is saying is that it's not being yeah. It's like being changed according to the situation, according to external or something, so you're not consistent in the things you do. Ah, okay, not consistent. consistent yes. Right, so, so basically you keep changing positions and... Okay, so, so you got, you got all, all the kind of changes. What else? What happens with uh, dysfunctional managers? Yeah, they don't want to change. Yeah, they don't want to change. 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 They don't Really, really... Uh, trying to, to find um, something when it's not there, or go for the details. No, why does this person try? Why, why, why does this person try to find things in their life? Why? 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 You really don't know what's going on, but you really want to prove a point, yeah. right? And uh, you mm -hmm. unfortunately you pick the wrong spot to prove the point, right? So that's that. That, that could be insecurity. What else? Anything else uh, that, that we know about um, dysfunctional managers? We've seen it. Lack of trust. Okay. And, uh, whatever you do, you say they don't trust you, right? And, 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 and. Maybe sometimes it's uh, conflicts uh, between uh, different cultures. Mm -hmm. It could be the different cultures. In what way? Some sort of. Um, maybe different cultures. <laughs> yeah. uh, for example, uh, yeah. I work in a French company, so yeah. uh, no, lot of procedures uh -huh. to to approve one uh, simple issue. Uh -huh. But make, for other people, they say, "Oh, why the GM or the department head they can make decision?" But but in a French mm -hmm. culture, oh, in my company, yeah, even for simple issue, we uh, we need to approve by different levels. Uh, the, sometimes okay. we approve by. Okay, the okay, very bureaucratic. Many, 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 why so many right. Why? 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 Why?
some of the key things. Number one, um, there's one thing about these functional managers is that they are extremely afraid of letting others know that they don't know. Right? So, so that, I mean, if, if, if you look, take an um, honest look at everyone, uh, everyone in the company, including yourselves, there will be, um, there will be instances, there will be situations where you don't know what to do, right, in every level, right, right from the CEO, the top person, down to uh, the frontline uh, workers, there will be things that we don't know, right, that's just, just, just a fact of working life, right, uh, and also the other thing is that when people get promoted, right, there's, there's, a, there's a famous saying from Peter Drucker, Peter Drucker, you will be promoted to your level of incompetency, right? You you get promoted to the point where the moment you start get promoted is because you are being promoted to a place where you really don't know what to do, right? So that's 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 a fact of life, and and the thing is that it's okay if you if you don't know you don't know. I mean, uh, you, if you don't know, you ask, right? Uh, you don't know, you join training, and somehow you learn on the job. Uh, that's that's uh, that's a fact of life. Um, People like me now. We we have uh, we have the election in the United States and all that. And, and we're not just talking about the current election. We're talking about every single election. Anyone who's been through uh, and became a president, the first year basically they learned on the job, all right? Unless they've been vice president before. Otherwise, the first year they learn on the job. There are a lot of things that they don't know. Somehow they learn, right? So that's. That's a fact of life. We will not know everything we need to know on our jobs, right? Even if we know everything we know, we need to know on our jobs, uh, and then what? Tomorrow comes, the world change, there will be new things, there will be new things that you don't know. That's a fact. Now, dysfunctional managers handle this situation a little bit uh, differently. They are very much afraid of letting people know that they don't know. Right, and in a way, it, it stems from what you mentioned about uh, trying to find bones in an egg, trying to find things when there's nothing there. Right, uh, being overly fussy and overly uh, interested in, in, in uh, minute little details that don't really matter. And the basis of that is that insecurity. They are very afraid to let people know that they don't know. Uh, part of it can also be due to culture. Why? Um, there are some Chinese managers, again, this, uh, uh, it really depends on which areas uh, we are looking at. Generally, we observe this more in uh, the factories, the, um, um, the production facilities, not in Shanghai, but uh, more towards the in, uh, inland, where managers, especially production managers, are very much afraid that their subordinates know much more than they do. Right, they intentionally want to suppress uh, the knowledge and abilities of their subordinates. Right? And also, they use the excuse by saying that if you train your workers, if you train your subordinates, what if they then work for someone else? Right? In a way, in a way it, they use it as, as a reason, but it, it's more like an excuse. Uh, to, that, to that question, if you, if you train your subordinates and then they work for someone else, what, what, what was the uh, counter suggestion to that? What if you don't train them and they stay? <laughs> right? So uh, that, that will be, uh, that, 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 that will be the, the bigger problem. But to them, the real response is, um, is it really you are, uh, you are afraid that they are being, uh, what I call, uh, snatched over by some competitors or by some headhunters, or is it because you're afraid that your subordinates know more than you? Right? And, and, and a lot of times it's, it's that <coughs> sense of insecurity. And th at, at some point we need to understand that, you know, is it a good thing that your subordinates know more than you? No, it's a good thing. Why? There are on two, on two, on two aspects. Number one, if you get people who know a lot of things, you can delegate them to do more things. It makes your life easier, right? So I got capable employees, 
And then um, they, they do a lot of things. That's one. Number two is if you're if you're a boss and you've got a bunch of subordinates, and uh, if your subordinates there are two scenarios. One is that your subordinates know a lot of things. The other scenario is your subordinates know nothing. Right? So this is two extreme scenarios. What will happen if you lead a team of people that know nothing? Failure. <laughs> they got failure, frustration, and not only that, what are the chances of your promotion? Oh, none. None. Right? Um, companies, basically, if they want to promote you to somewhere else, yeah. they need to find a successor. And then they look at their department, and then they are like a bunch of uh, incompetent idiots. <laughs> right? No one can fill in your shoes, so you'll be stuck in your position forever. Right, so it's, it's, it's about how you how you look at things, and um, there, there's some, some reason that people feel insecure just because people around them know more than them. So they're, they're very much very afraid of letting people uh, know that they don't know, they're afraid to get help, they're afraid to ask questions, they are even afraid to even come to sessions like this, to, to attend training. Uh, because they view, to, to most people, people view training as um, you learn something, you get to meet friends, you get to wine and dine, not wine, but dine in five-star hotels, right? free food, right? you get a day off from work, right? that, that sort of thing. Uh, we all like training. Uh, but to these people, um, going for training actually is a sign of weakness. That means you don't know something. Right? And they intentionally also hold back training uh, for, for, for the team. So that's, that's, um, uh, that's one, one thing. And because of this, it leads to the next part. They're afraid to let people know that they don't know. So what do they do? They pretend to know when they don't. Right? So that's, that's when, um, when, it's, when it comes to discussions, they'll ask questions on things that are not really consequential to, uh, to the main discussion. They'll, they'll try to make uh, some points or give in some details or contributions that really are not part of that discussion. Right? Uh, that's one. Or they want to make decisions when they don't really know what's going on. Right? And, and sometimes it can be very dangerous if you want to make uh, decisions when you really, really don't know what, uh, what's going on. Uh, <clears throat> that's number two. And when you are afraid of letting people know that you don't know, and you do that by pretending you know, the next thing that you are uh, afraid of is um, when people challenge you, when people start to raise questions and ask you for details, well, then, then it, uh, it becomes a war zone, right? It becomes uh, someone really touch your pain points or your panic points or your fear points, and that you tend to uh, blow up. So it becomes very defensive um, and say that, who, I mean, why are you asking me this question? Who's the boss here? Right? If you ask, ask questions like this, you are being insubordinate. Right? You're, you're, not, uh, you're not part of the team. So, so they, are, they are using the authority to be defensive right? and defend their ideas, which actually are bad ideas in the first place. So that's, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, number three. And all these are uh, uh, the steps. It's five mistakes. But they're all related. It goes step by step, and it goes um, from bad and and um, roll down to worse, right? <clears throat> and uh, number four, if you want to prevent people from uh, challenging you, the best way is surround yourself with yes men, people who will not challenge you, people who will just say yes, people who will say, "Well, boss, you are very smart," even though it's horrible. Right, so that's uh, so, 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 so all them with a uh, yes man and uh, the, the, the Chinese translation, uh, this is in this This is uh, historical uh, meaning when emperors have got the, what I call uh, officials that basically say nice things about the emperor, doesn't give any suggestions, only give praises and flattery. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing. You feel good. You feel safe, you feel secure, but you're not getting anything done. People just say yes, even though it's a bad idea. Now, of course, when you have bad ideas, and you've got people around you who say yes to everything, what will happen to those bad ideas? It gets implemented, right? And then what happens next? 
这些馊主意，然后这馊主意就被那个什么，呃，被实施贯彻，软固着。Ah, lose money. You get into a big trouble. So something really, really big, big、uh, happens, right? You,、uh, you go into big trouble. So what happens when this manager finds that and goes into big trouble? You blame others for your own mistakes, right? And what's not written here is you also, if it, if anything were to go well. This is the two two mirror, right? As, as what Greg has mentioned earlier,、uh, what is if things go wrong, you find a scapegoat. It's someone's fault. It's not your fault, but someone else's fault. But、right? you always find someone to blame, right? And fire. So that that's one. Number two is when someone goes something actually went well. Some ideas are the great ideas and was implemented. They will claim credit for so,、uh, from someone else. 就是说，如果事情搞砸了，找个戴罪羔羊；如果事情办成了，那就是领导阴谋深。Right? So, so that's so you can claim, you claim credit、uh, for for things that、uh, really has got nothing to do with you. Right? And, and, and that's、um, the the five main characteristics. There may be more, but this is、uh, from from general observation. This is what we found, and it's、uh, a slide rule that goes、uh, all the way down. Oh, by the way,、um, we're, we're taking a lot of notes. So what I want to say is that.、Um, We have a QR code, WeChat code at the end, so we can just scan it. In fact, it's on the back of the、uh, the brochures. We can scan it and、um, and、uh, we'll, we'll key in some keywords. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know the keywords later on,、um, and you'll you'll be able to download the whole、uh, PPT slides. Okay, so so this this is、uh, so this is some of the mistakes. Now, if you have these mistakes, what do you think will be the impact on the organization? 对整个企业有什么影响？负面影响 ？It becomes a dysfunctional organization. <laughs> <laughs> dysfunctional. Well, number one, staff turnover. Yeah. And not just normal staff turnover. You find the best people leave first. Yeah. Right. Usually, I mean, if it's staff turnover, it's, it's more or less average. And for good companies. Staff turnover is the worst people leave first. For normal company, it's kind of average. You got good people leaving, got not so good people leaving.、Uh, but for dysfunctional managers or the, in their teams, if they are not the top manager, then in their teams and own all、uh, departments, the best people will go first. Okay, because the best people are not worried about one thing: jobs. <laughs> the best people,、um, when they are when it's in the evenings, in the weekends. They'll get a lot of cold calls from who? Ten hundreds. We we have a good opportunity here. Do you want to explore better opportunities,、uh, better growth, better better advancements, right? And then、uh, initially, the best people may say, "Ah,、oh, no, I just join this job. I'm good. I'm, I'm going to put more effort in this job." And then day in day out, they are they're met with the dysfunctional managers who basically claim, claim credit and、uh, put blame on them and、uh, just not listen to them, get very defensive and so on. It's like. They'll, after a month or two, they'll think about why am I wasting my life、uh, on this kind of job? Why am I working for this kind of boss? And by the way, why? What is? What? What are some of the key reasons why people leave their jobs? The boss, right?、Uh, there's there's an old saying. I mean, it's not. A, it may not be the biggest reason, but it's, it's definitely one of the main reasons. There's an old saying that say that people join the company because of the company. Because it's a great company, it's a nice name, and they're, they're possible, good development, good future, good、uh, career plans, and so on. But they leave because of the boss, right? So that's、uh, that's an old saying.、Um, it's not. It may not be the biggest reason, but it is definitely one of the key reasons why people leave. It just could not stand and、uh, don't find it. It's it's, a, it's it's not a boss that they look up to. So you find、um, uh, staff turnover of the best people.、Um, And those who stay, or those who have not le-、uh, left yet,、uh, you, you have low productivity, low competitiveness, because you're not really putting effort to um, um, make the company better. You're also not adopting the best ideas, the best ways to、uh, be more competitive against the competitors, and of course,、uh, morale is going to be bad generally. So it's just a bad、uh, state of affairs. And 
that's going to be high opportunity cost. Uh, under a good boss, under a good normal leader, we're not even say outstanding leader, just a normal one, a good manager. Um, anything that needs to be done will be done. Anything that has a good chance of succeed, of success will be uh, will gain success. Right, you'll succeed. But under a dysfunctional boss, and things that could have been done well, it's not that tough. It's not that difficult. Uh, can be ruined, can, can go badly. So you have a lot of high opportunity costs, right? So that's, that's, that's a cost for, for, for a company. And um, the next question is, enough of whining and complaining. What can we do about it, right? And to do that, uh, <clears throat> we're really going to do a little, little detour and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about things about Firstly, we're going to think about this person. Is there, is there something about EQ that this person can do? And uh, I'm not an expert in EQ. I'm going to invite our, our, our special guest guest speaker. Because I'm the guest speaker, so the I'm guest, guest, guest. Invite, the guest speaker. So it's a guest guest speaker. Uh, we can get Greg to talk about uh, the, the the EQ and how uh, how the emotional part uh, can be managed. Thank you. Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, we, uh, thank you so much. Actually, we held a uh, EQ workshop uh, last week in Lucia, too. So maybe you could help out here, too. <laughs> uh, certain point. The question is, what is what is EQ? What does that mean, emotional intelligence? What does that mean? To you? People oriented. Yes. Um, it's, uh, here's the model, I see you actually already showed, it is about being people oriented, and the first person that's most important to be oriented towards is yourself. You know, being self-aware. And what does that mean to be self-aware? So what each, what does that mean? Aware of what? Yourself. Yourself. And? and, and. <laughs> Uh, in the legal way, absolutely right. So you hear what she said, to kind of know who you are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. In emotional intelligence uh, coaching, we do coaching, it's really helping the person discover your strengths and your weaknesses, but also what are your underlying preferences in your natural self? What's your underlying preference? And then what's your everyday behavior? Sometimes we have underlying preferences which may or may not manifest itself in your everyday behaviors. And then also then what are your, what's your, what we call our, your overextended self? What are you like when you're stressed? And what are the stress triggers? What are those triggers that, that you, uh, that kind of push your button, that, that makes you uh, extend your personality traits? And these, what we're talking about really are personality traits and how we manage those uh, personality traits. And another aspect of self-awareness, of course, is what you said, is what do you want? And by what do you, what's your motivation, but to the point, you know, what are your core values? What's your purpose for being? Those core values are so important because when your values are not in line with the people you work with or your boss who may appear dysfunctional or your job, then you're out of alignment. So it's kind of discovering that. So that's the first step, being self-aware. That's the basis. And only once when you're self-aware, then you can start asking those same questions about your key stakeholders. Your boss, who may or may not be dysfunctional, your, your co-worker, your colleague. And you ask the same questions. What are their personality traits? What are their core values? Are their values aligned with your values? What are their stress triggers? How do you push their buttons? And it's kind of ironic because this topic's about dysfunctional managers. Um, I've been very blessed uh, throughout my career working with amazing leaders. I have learned from them on how to be a better leader. But early in my career, I did work for a dysfunctional boss. I thought was dysfunctional, but it wasn't dysfunctional. I didn't know dysfunctional until 30 years later, when I worked for 
uh, a, a person five years ago when I first came to Shanghai, believe it or not, he was a management consultant who specialized in MBTI. Specialized in MBTI, gave advice to other clients. So he was very good. So he claims that this and this. So being aware, he can, he can immediately read you and say, oh, you are an ENTJ or you're whatever. You know how to type people. But what he didn't do is this. So being self-aware and aware of others, what's the next step? Managing your emotions. Control yourself? Uh, not suppress or control. Yeah, it's control, but it's being aware of yourself and then having that freedom on how you will respond to any given stimulus. You choose how you want to respond. You may want to respond, you know, uh, if you choose to, maybe even with anger at the right time. Aristotle said, any man can be angry, but a person who can be angry at the right time, at the right person, in the right context <laughs> is difficult. So it's really just being aware of yourself and uh, Vic, there is a psychologist by the name of Vic, um, uh, uh, Victor Frankl. What's that? Frankl. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Victor Frankl. Uh, he was a uh, psychologist passed away many years ago. And Frankl actually was a Holocaust survivor. Holocaust is the, the video tyrant, Dr. Right? Oh. And actually survived. Uh, and the reason he survived it, he was able to choose his response on how he wanted to feel given those dire circumstances. So when uh, through coaching, we talk about how to manage your emotions, is how do you respond to given situations given a certain context, depending on the person that you're dealing with. Also, how you want to feel yourself. So, and that could mean having that, once you decide uh, on that, once you have a certain feeling and you're aware of your own emotions, then you make that choice as to, here's how I'm going to deal with this problem, which is the fourth one, taking meaningful action. Is this approach going to be in line with my core values? Um, it may mean having that critical conversation with your boss. It may mean adapting your behavior accordingly. It may mean saying, hey, this particular boss is not in line with my values or this situation, this relationship. It, so you, it could be many, many different things, uh, different approaches. Meaningful action is doing things which are in line with your core values. That's my, uh, that's my take. It's funny. Uh, with one dysfunctional boss, I actually was able to determine he is dysfunctional in certain areas, but he's very positive in other areas. And I, I had to deal with, with that, kind of had to navigate and dance with that. We talked about dancing with emotions in our workshop. One boss, I, I, I just decided this is not going to work. And so I, I resigned. I left. I joined directions. <laughs> Any questions on... EQ. Hey, what are your experience with emotional intelligence? Have you worked with EQ or have you had experiences like this where you had to manage your reaction or manage your responses with a boss or with a colleague? Or with the other half? Ah. <laughs> oh, in, in your America, parents? All that, you're, you're better half. <laughs> better half? Your in-laws? Yes. <laughs> I think the most difficult is to uh, take meaningful action. Most of the time, well, we, um, we try to uh, aware of our, um, ourselves and the others, but right. taking meaningful... That's the hardest step, that's the absolutely. That's really the hardest. And uh, sometimes, in my case, sometimes, oh, I know my boss, okay. Functional and uh, okay, I I, I I change. I look for other others, but as situation, Which is what happens. yeah, you look for a well ideal company. But when you join, okay. Do, the, do you know why Hawk <laughs> is here today? No. Hawk is a headhunter. 
Ah, he's looking for a, a disenfranchised employees. But you're so right, taking that meaningful action, and it does, it does take courage. Right, and and I, I it's funny, I have coached uh, people who've worked for dysfunctional bosses, but I've also coached so-called dysfunctional bosses. And I say so-called because it's how you define dysfunctional. Uh, Goldsmith um, wrote a book called uh, what, uh, what, what got, got you, you here? here won't get you there. It's a very what got you here won't get you there. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you all have these. As a manager, you have certain skills and knowledge that got you to this point. But now you're a leader of people, and your emotional behaviors, like taking credit for someone else, not saying thank you, you know, losing your temper. All these things can affect you as a leader, and which will create this turnover. CJ mentioned. And by doing that, it won't get you there, which is what vice president, president, leaders. Leaders don't have the answers. They are not the experts. What are they an expert at? They're an expert at leading people and providing a vision. Right. <laughs> exactly. What's that? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but that is so difficult. So on, on the taking meaningful action, actually, what we use is a simple coaching tool called the GROWS model. What is your goal? What is it that you want? What's the current reality? What are the options right now? Just, just kind of write them down, and then what will you do? But that takes a lot of uh, takes a lot of meaningful thought in order to take that meaningful action. Okay. That's my two cents on each. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right now. <clears throat> That's the EQ part, and, and it's a basis of, if you, if you want to manage a dysfunctional manager, what we really hope them to become is fully um, try to install some self-awareness into them. That, that's the first step. If people don't want to change, there's no way you can change them. How many of us has got kids? Kids, 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 right? Kids, right? Um, is it easy or difficult to change the behaviors of your kids? Yeah. It's not easy, yeah. right? You're, yeah. you're, you're the mom, you're the dad. That is your son, you know, that's your child. That is a child, right? And you want to change them, it's not that easy, and that's your child. Now imagine someone who is 30, 40 years old, Right, who's got all these behaviors, who's got all these attitudes, who's, who's got all these personalities that's ingrained into them for like so many years, right? And now you want to change them? It's, um, uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's close, right? So it's, it's really difficult. Now, um, when, when we talk about um, the, the different theories of personalities, right, and the different schools of thoughts, but generally, um, by what age will we form our values, our personalities, the way our, our, our views of the world? It's about 20 years old. I mean, around that. I mean, there's no hard and fast rule. Some people say it's much younger. Some people say it's older. Yeah. But let's let's go to something that's more generous. Let's say by the age of 20 or 21, you are an adult, right? And by the time you're an adult, basically your values, your the views of the world, the way you think, the way you act, they're more or less fixed. Especially the values. So if you if you're if you're insecure. Uh, as a person by age 20, you're going to be insecure for a long time. Unless you are aware that this insecurity or something about it is not really working for you. And only you can make the change. No one else can make you make the change. Only you. So the first step is just to let the person have uh, self awareness. Right? Uh, before you do that, everything else is futile, everything else will not work. 我对方没有一种自知之明，他那个后后后面的东西都都都都是白做。Okay, so that's that's the that's the first thing, and that is the hardest thing. 你要对方有这种自知之明是最难的。Right, 
and, and um, there, there's some, uh, some, some aspects that we may want to consider doing. Number one is, firstly, prevention is always better than cure. The prevention part is going to be better than the cure. Right? If you are able, uh, from a company perspective, you are able to promote, you are able to uh, develop people, not just based on their hard skills, but are they suitable for the job? Are they, you know, do, do, they, do they have that serious sense of insecurity? Are they willing to develop other people? Do they care for, for the subordinates and all the team members and so on? So those, those are, those are some of the things. Do they, do they actually think things uh, more of a company-wide point of view and not just a personal uh, point of view? So these are some of the, the qualities of how we want to promote the suitable person. A lot of times when we promote people, let's say we want to promote um, an engineering manager. Right. What kind of person do we uh, promote? The best engineer. Right? If you have a finance manager, who do we promote? The best finance person. Right? And, and so on. The, the sales manager, the best sales person. And that's how we promote people. We promote uh, them based on the hard skills. But the thing is, you want to go to the next level. You've got to think about, do they have... The, some of the traits, some of the abilities to go to the next level of things. So can they do uh, the leader's yeah. work? Right. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's the first thing we, we need to think about. Um, and we'll have a slide on, on what is suitability and what is uh, hard skills and eligibility and what. Two is, at some point, someone needs to tell them as it is. You need to give them direct feedback. It's not going to be easy, but someone has to do it. Right? Usually, in an ideal world, uh, that manager's boss has to do it. That's the ideal one. But uh, the reason that you have this functional manager is because the boss either is not around, or it could be that this functional manager reports to the boss that is in your corporate HQ. There's no one to give direct feedback all the time, or that boss can be very, very busy, who is uh, always traveling, uh, and really had hardly time to really understand what went on, what's going right, what's going wrong with, um, um, with, with, with this manager and his team. Right? So that's, that, that could be in uh, that could be those issues. So maybe the manager's boss may not be able to give direct feedback. So what if that happens? How? What is the next best solution? A lot of times uh, this is what we call peer feedback. And this is red. In China, right? Peer feedback means, uh, let's say you are finance manager, and uh, this finance manager is really dysfunctional and that's really, really messing up a lot of things. What will, what would be some of the feedback of, uh, say, the HR, the sales, and so on? They start at the same level, but different departments. They're at the same level in a way that usually there's not much um, of who's the boss, who's not the boss. But between different departments, usually you need to work together. Right, and at, at times uh, you need to have um, the, the peer to peer feedback and, and tell people to tell the to tell the to tell the person that well, maybe some of the things that you're doing is not really, really helpful. Uh, maybe I will not comment on what you're doing to your team, but what you're doing to the rest of us, it's not really helpful. Right, uh, usually this does not work. I, I wouldn't say this does not work in China, but people tend not to want to do this in China. Why? Um, it's, a, it's, about, it's, not about, it's not just about phase, it's not just about giving phase. It's about we are more prone, we are more inclined to be more indirect. Right? And if you want to give feedback, we are, we are also very high contextual. We, we, we don't say things like this. We just say that, oh, maybe we have a better idea. 
uh, maybe certain things it's not very convenient. Can we just do it so it's easier? Right? Or, or, or so on. We don't, we don't really tell people that, well, uh, that's not the kind of uh, uh, actions or behavior that, that, that we like to see. We like to look things in a different way. We are not as direct as, um, as sometimes needs to be. Right? So that's, that's, that, that's the thing that, about, about feedback. Uh, the next question is, what if that dysfunctional manager is the general manager? <laughs> and it happens. <laughs>